Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle, AKA Stitcherista here on YouTube. And today is Tuesday, January 25th. And I'm off work again today. The only days we actually have jobs on the calendar is Thursday and Friday. And Friday's job, I'm gonna be working from 4 p.m. till seven. It's such a bizarre, odd time, but so I let Bill know last night, hey, we're going to be eating dinner late. I'm going to be working until, you know, 7.15 probably. Um, yeah, it's just so bizarre. Um, so yesterday, if you watch my videos, Velky Pataki, all that, and their website's back up. So I have a couple little notes. So Velky Pataki's website is back up. If you want to go and order, um, the stand that I have actually cost $155 and then it was $50 shipping because you have to remember it's coming from the Ukraine. Yeah. Okay. So that, and then, um, my online friend Sandra reminded me that I should tell every woman that watches this to please go and get your mammograms. I know I usually say this when I get my yearly one, but it is so vitally important, um, if I wouldn't have been getting my mammograms, my breast cancer would not have been caught probably until it was way too late because I felt nothing. Like I didn't feel it at all. And, uh, you know, do self exams and, you know, <laughs> Bill likes to joke that he takes care of that for me every month, <laughs> many times during the month. Right. Um, yeah, he, he likes to joke about that. Right. And, uh, so do you guys watch um, the reboot of Sex and the City? You know, it's 20 years later, and a little spoiler alert from this most recent episode. Carrie goes down to her downstairs neighbor, and the girl's boyfriend opens the door, and he winds up dropping his towel, and you see his penis, like, full frontal. And I literally... When they did it, my mouth fell open and I think I even like screamed a little bit because if you watch movies and watch TV, in the U.S. anyway, they will show a woman nude all the fucking live long day, but you hardly ever see a man. And it was so shocking that I was just like, ah, like, yeah, I did something like that. And then I was telling Bill about it and I texted Jill and I was like, did you watch the episode? And she was like, oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And this guy's like in his 20s. So yeah, he was an ass though in the show. But yeah, so that little tidbit. And I listened. So I did stitch last yesterday and last night. And while listening to the second season of the podcast, Something is Wrong. Wow, this podcast. I'm really liking it. Um, the second season wasn't as long as the first season. So I was able to get through it like all in one day. And yeah, so stitching. I feel like I'm just discombobulated today. So still working on the Dilly Dahlia from Ink Circles. I'm making progress for sure. Um, so I got the orange done and then part of the red done. So I got a little bit more of the red to do and then I'll be able to start on the inside of the flower. So the inside of the flower is this orange color and then like a pinky orange color. You know, I, I did a conversion. These are not the colors that were called for. The only colors that resemble the original colors are these green colors. But I'm using Salky, stitching it on 18 count Ada. Yeah, I have all the details in the description box. So I will work on that more today for sure. And so I absolutely love Casey Bonajario. I don't even know if that's how you say her name. Her cross stitch patterns. And I think a long time ago when they were out, like in the early 2000s, I probably owned them, but then in my little things, probably sold it, bought it, sold it. I, I do that. I did that so many times. Well, I didn't own any now, like for a long time. And now they're out of print, like you can't get them. So I have an, an eBay search saved. So every time somebody lists one, I get an email. And... I own the chocolate, I don't know where it is, the chocolate cake sampler, which I really do want to stitch that one. It looks so cool. Um, 
it looks like a lot of fun. So, and it's only a couple colors, so I could easily convert that to sulky. So I definitely want to do that one. And then, um, a whole bunch on eBay came up like this seller must have been selling all of theirs. And I bid on a couple or I watched a couple and some of them were getting ridiculous prices like 20, $25. Now I did pay $20 for the chocolate cake sampler because I really, really wanted it. And then I bid on one, I bid on the cherry cheesecake sampler and I want it. I want it for $6 and 50 cents, which is pretty much retail. Here it is. Oh my God. Right. Okay. So I absolutely love this and it's only, well, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 colors. So quite a bit. Um, I probably would use DMC with this only because it is, um, there's shading involved. Now, if you look close, this is a specialty stitch, this row. And then here is like lazy daisy stitches. I was actually considering trying to find buttons, like just another button company, um, getting five buttons and, and using them instead of doing the stitches. It would just be so much easier, right? Why not? Buttons are pretty. But yeah, I absolutely love this one. And on top of the little piece of cheesecake right here, those are beads. So this one would be a lot of fun to stitch. Um, the ones I had bid on, I would bid on pineapple upside down cake. And they have a hot chocolate one that I really like. But I have found there's a couple sellers on Etsy. I've been adding patterns to my Etsy cart, just adding them and not buying them. Because I'm hoping to get like a gift card for my birthday or Valentine's Day or something like that. Because I have it on my wish list and I told Bill that that's what I want. And um, definitely birthday, like that would be easy. But they're all PDF patterns and there are so many awesome designers on Etsy that, oh my God, like there's so much out there pattern wise. Okay. Oh, so the last thing before we do, we're going to do a true crime story today. So at least once a day, I will get someone who will message me, either leave a comment on a video or email me and say, Hey, have you ever done a video on this? Nine times out of 10, I have. And today was a prime example because I decided, I said, you know what? I'm going to say something in a video because this person, they had, it was a comment on when I did my scrapbook finish of the Hello Summer by Shannon Christine Designs. And they said, you know, do you actually put these in a scrapbook? What do you do with them? I would love to see. Um, I do put them in a scrapbook and I have a video on it. So I searched for the video and I linked it to them, but I implore you guys before you leave me a comment like that or ask me a question, please try to search. All I had to do was go in YouTube and put in Stitcherista scrapbook. The very first video that came up said my cross stitch scrapbook finishes. Um, there was somebody, I want to say loop method when I was doing the loop method videos, if you put in Stitcherista loop method, it's going to bring up all those videos. Like it is that easy. And nine times out of 10, if you are wondering if I've done a video on something, I have, I, I've done a lot of videos. I've done a lot of cross stitch videos and I've done a lot of tutorials in the description box or in my link tree. I think I have two playlists linked. I have beginner cross stitch series about how to read a pattern, how to measure your fabric. I have a playlist linked of all of those. And then I also have like cross stitch tutorials, beading, fractional stitches. I mean, I literally have done everything and I should put in that playlist, which I might do that after this video, like how to handle excess fabric, decorating your Q snaps. Those would be good videos to put in that playlist. So, but please, please, please do that search. It is very simple. Stitcherista and whatever your, your question is, because most of the time my video is going to come up. Okay. So, um, I also received a payment through Linktree, a donation of $5 from Sherry Tracy. So Sherry, thank you so much. I very, very much appreciate that. And it goes right in my PayPal account, which is awesome. So very much appreciated on that. Okay. So still loving the stand and my lamp and the lamp in the corner. 
all of that the setup fantastical like it literally now like i have my setup i seriously do and i just i enjoy it so so much um so i'm very very happy about that okay so today's true crime story is brookie which is what an odd little name brookie lee west jesus the first sentence as a child, Brookie Lee West had two role models in her life, neither of them even remotely positive. Mm. Her father, Leroy, was a white supremacist and a practicing Satanist, so Satan, who frequently preached his hateful beliefs to the little girl and her younger brother. The children's mother, Christine, was no better. She was a serial philanderer who frequently left her children unattended and unfed while she entertained gentlemen callers. Wow, fantastic role models. Like, that upbringing, how horrible. And, you know, I don't think people realize truly how important it is for your children, especially in those formative years, to just really have good guidance. Like, when I think about when I was really young, you know, I think about, I turned out well, as, as far as I, I think, in spite of how my childhood was, in spite of how my stepfather behaved towards me and my brother on a daily, daily basis. And I like to think that if I didn't have my grandparents and that normalcy with them, that it may not have gone that way. Um... And, you know, I, I want to say my brother was treated a little better than I was. Um, it was my brother's biological father, but my stepfather still called him a pussy and shit like that at dinner. Oh, yeah, dinner was like a, just a, a fiasco every single day. I remember vividly my mother... She'd be cooking dinner and we'd be upstairs in our bedrooms or whatever. And she would just say, he's getting ready to come home. Let's just get through dinner. Because my stepfather had the habit most of the time of, um, he would go out after he was on a bowling league. Or he would just leave and go out and come to find out the last couple years, two years, he was cheating on my mother. So that's where he was going. Um, but just... <sighs> Yeah, I got off on a tangent there. But um, I feel like some of the issues that I have as an adult may have come from that. Um, I don't know. So just treat your kids right, please. Just just do it. Just do it. <laughs> That's my PSA, too, for that. Just, just treat your children right, please. Okay. Um, so the mother would end up serving a prison term after shooting, shooting and injuring one of her lovers with a shotgun. Fabulous. With such a calamitous background, it would hardly have been surprising if Brookie had fallen into a life of vice and hard times herself. But she was a bright and ambitious girl who did surprisingly well at school and went on to a lucrative career as an in-demand technical writer. Unfortunately, those smarts did not extend to her personal life. Like her mother before her, Brookie West had an attraction to deadbeats. Oy. So this is where the story is going to come in because she must, um, not, not good choices in men. Yeah. So during the early 1990s, Brookie started dating a man named Howard St. John, a bone idol loser who refused to work and spent his days drinking and getting high. Great. Where'd he get the money for that? That's my first question all the time, right? To St. John, Brookie was a godsend, a meal ticket that he was only too happy to exploit. For reasons known only to herself, Brookie seemed happy with this arrangement. She even accepted Howard's proposal of marriage, tying the knot with him in May 1994, but the marital bliss would be short-lived. And when I hear that, without being crass and crude, I have to think... He must have some good golden china. Like, do you know what I'm saying? He must, like, he must know what to do with that thing. Because 
I, what would, what's the allure there? You're like, you got, you got to have a J-O-B if you want to be with me, right? From that song, what's it, uh, No Scrub song or En Vogue or something back from the 90s. Yeah, he doesn't have a job, drinking and getting high all day. What's the draw there? What's, what's the benefit there? Yeah, I, I don't know. But there are people, too, that don't want to be alone, so will accept any kind of ridiculous behavior from people. Yeah. Okay. So in June 1994, two months after the marriage, two months, police were called to the couple's home in Los Banos, Nevada. There they found Howard St. John nursing a flesh wound to his neck, claiming that his wife had tried to kill him. According to Howard, Brookie had asked him to torch her Jaguar so that she could claim insurance on the vehicle. Really? When he refused, she fetched her 32 handgun, came up behind him, and pulled the trigger. Had her aim not been off, he might have been killed. That close, probably pretty much point-blank range, yeah, she probably could have killed him. But Brookie, however, told a different story. Of course she did. Come on now. She said that Howard was frequently abusive to her and had been that day. She did not deny firing the gun, but claimed that she had done so in self-defense. So in the end, prosecutors decided that, is, that it was a case of he said, she said, and would be difficult to win in court, and they declined to pursue the matter. Brookie, who had initially been charged with aggravated assault, was released. Mm. So what did Howard do now that his pistol-packing wife was free again? You might think that he would have run for the hills, putting as much distance between himself and Brookie as possible, but Howard knew where his bread was buttered. He had no fucking money? What's he going to do? No job and no money. Where is he going to go? Where else was he going to find a woman who allowed him to laze around the house while she went off to work? I would be good goddamned, let me tell you. Where else was he going to find someone to pay for his booze and drugs and for the roof over his head? Nowhere, right? And Howard knew it. He came crawling back, full of apologies, even though he was the injured party. Bad mistake. Big, colossal mistake. Two weeks later, two weeks later, two weeks later on June 6, 1994, police officers in California were called to the scene of a gruesome discovery. Howard St. John's body had been found by hikers in a national forest. Oy. He had been shot in the torso, although that was not the cause of death. A plastic bag had been pulled over his mouth and nose, causing him to asphyxiate. So deliberately done. Given the history between the two of them, the police immediately suspected his wife, Brookie. Of course they did. However, they were unable to find any evidence connecting her to the crime, and the case eventually went cold. So she was probably tired of his fucking bullshit and was like, I got to do something, right? I got to get rid of his dumb ass. Well, killing someone isn't necessarily the answer. But given if he was violent towards her, maybe she was afraid. I don't know. Um, but let me tell you, your spouse dies in a way like that. You are suspect uno, number one. You're suspect number one. You are getting a phone call by the police. For sure. The spouse is always the first suspect. Because... It's like some statistic, like 85% or something of crimes are committed to people that knew each other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So fast forward four years. So Howard's case has gone cold, right? Fast forward four years and we find Brookie living in Las Vegas, Nevada, where she had moved to take care of her ailing mother. The mother who was the philanderer, cheated, left her kids unfed, untaken care of while she got hers, right? Yeah. Given the way that Christine, so Christine is the mother, given the way that Christine had treated her in childhood, this might seem like a selfless display of altruism on Brookie's part. But appearances can be deceptive. Mm. Brookie was a far from ideal caregiver. She was short-tempered and verbally abusive towards Christine, who had various ailments and had started to display the initial symptoms of Alzheimer's. Oh my God, which is a horrible disease to watch your loved one go through it and not to mention taking care of someone who has it my mother can attest to that and it is probably the most horrific thing that I've just witnessed um so I pray to God I'd never have to encounter that with me my mother any any other woman in our family any man it doesn't matter but it's an awful awful disease okay so in fact 
Brookie may have had an entirely selfish reason for taking responsibility for her mother's care. Hmm, money? It's got to be money because it's always money, right? So Christine disappeared sometime in February 1998. When neighbors asked Brookie about her mother's whereabouts, she told them that Christine had moved to California to live with her brother Travis. They had no reason to disbelieve her, even when some of them noticed that Christine's social security checks were still being delivered to her apartment. What did I say? Money. Two reasons why somebody is going to kill somebody else. Money and love. Two reasons. Then in June 1998, Brookie was also gone, vacating the apartment without so much as a goodbye. So three more years passed. So it's four years and it's three years. So now it's seven years, right? Then on February 5th, 2001, Bill Unruh, an employee at Canyon Gate Mini Storage in Las Vegas, noticed a foul smell emanating from Unit 317 at the facility. Unruh opened the unit and saw a large plastic garbage can with a brown liquid oozing out onto the concrete floor. Ugh. The smell was even more powerful in the unit, and Unruh really did not know, did not want to know what was causing it. So he shut up the unit and he called the police. Good thinking. That was smart. Thus it was that the mystery of Christine's sudden disappearance was solved. Officers who responded to the call were met with the gruesome sight of a badly decomposed body wrapped in plastic and rammed into the garbage can. Now, let's think through that. Did you not think that was ever going to be found? A body decomposing literally smells like death. I mean, eventually the smell was going to leak out of there. And Christine had to, Christine, Brookie had to have been the one to rent the storage unit. They could not tell how long the body had been there, but estimated that it must have been at least a year. Holy shit. The plastic wrapping had more than likely masked the stench until now, but it had recently split, allowing body fluids to leak out. Oh. A possible identity of the victim was established when police found prescription information and a document regarding authorization of social security payments. Dental records would later confirm that this was indeed Christine Smith. As for a suspect, that was easy too, because just what I said, the unit had been rented to Brookie. So her fingerprints were also lifted from the plastic the body had been wrapped in. Brookie, what the hell are you thinking, girl? Come on now. Brookie was arrested on the evening of February 5th, 2001 and charged with first degree murder. Under interrogation, she denied killing her mother, insisting that Christine had died of natural causes. Well, if she did, okay, let's say that she did. She still wanted to get her checks, which is fraud anyway. Yeah. She admitted transporting the body to the storage unit, but could provide no explanation as to why she had done so rather than calling the authorities after finding her mother dead. The police already knew the answer, just what I said. Brookie had continued to cash her mother's social security checks after her death and had cleaned out her bank accounts in a series of withdrawals starting in February 1998. So, as to how the murder had been committed, experts believe that Christine had been asphyxiated, possibly in the same way that Howard St. John had been killed. They further speculated that West might have used her mother's confused state of mind to overdose her on medication, causing her to pass out. And that would have made it easy for Brookie to suffocate her. Yeah. It was a neat theory, but one that still had to be proved in a court of law. Fortunately for investigators, Brookie had already shown them how to do that. She had made a crucial error under interrogation. According to Brookie's story, she had fretted for two days over what to do with the corpse. During that time, she had left her mother lying in the bed. So that statement gave forensics the opportunity to prove her a liar. The science of forensic entomology has to do with insect activity on a dead body. This follows a predictable pattern and is usually in initiated by blowfly infestation within hours of death. If what Brookie was saying was true, if she had left the body for two days, then there should have been blowfly larvae present in the corpse, except that there wasn't. And the only way that could have happened was if the body had been immediately isolated after death, for example, if it had been wrapped in plastic, like it was. So, Brookie had not spent two days agonizing over what to do. She had all planned, she had planned it out. It was premeditated for sure. So, yeah. 
So Brookie was eventually convicted of her mother's murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. But is that the full extent of her misdeeds? Likely not, no. The murder of Howard St. John remains unsolved, although there was strong evidence to suggest that Brookie was involved. And she may well be responsible for at least one more murder. What? Her brother, Travis Lee Smith Jr., disappeared in 1993 and has never been found. The police have thus far been unable to link Brookie to the disappearance, but there are circumstantial evidence that puts her in the frame. After Travis went missing, she continued cashing his Social Security checks. Jesus Christ. Wow. So, a little footnote to the story. On July 20th, 2012, Brookie attempted to escape from the Florence McClure Women's Correctional Center in North Las Vegas, Nevada. She was soon recaptured. So, she's going to die in prison. I mean, she's going to be in there forever. But wowza. Wowza, wowza, wowza. Oh my God. Okay. The book that I'm reading. Oh, we got to do our little unfuck ourselves, right? Ah, I can't grab it. Um, the book I'm reading is so, so good. It is by Frida McFadden, which I've read a lot of her books and they're all available on Kindle Unlimited. This one is called, Do You Remember? It's about a woman who was in a, an accident and had a traumatic brain injury and she doesn't remember anything day to day. Now, the book is broken up into five days, says day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. So I'm on day two, and it's almost like Groundhog Day because kind of the same. You got to read it. I I, I just, it, it's hard for me to stop reading this book because I have to know what happens. <laughs> it's that good. So I absolutely love books like that. So I will link the book in the description box of the video so you can check it out if you want. All right, so today's entry on how we're going to continue to unfuck ourselves, right? Interesting. Okay, your purpose. So, you know, there's a lot talked about that, you know, we're all here for a purpose. Everyone's purpose is different. And I even question, like, what's my purpose here, right? What's your purpose? So this one says your purpose if you could let go of what you need, what would your life be about? That's your purpose. Hmm. Have to put on my thinking cap for that one. If you could let go of what you need, what would your life be about? See, some people, I feel like they recognize their purpose very easily. Like people who are in maybe... Um, like preachers or, you know, people like Joyce Meyer or Tony Robbins or, you know, motivational speakers. I think they feel like their purpose is to help people in that way. Um, I don't know. I've never had like clarity, complete clarity on this is my purpose. This is why I'm here. Um, I don't know. That's a good one now. If you could let go of what you need and what you think you need isn't always what you need in my opinion. That's subjective too. But okay, think about that. <laughs> Chew on that, right? And let me know down below, what do you think your purpose is? I'm curious. Okay, so I hope you guys are all having a great day. Get some stitching done, read, get through, get through your work day if you're working today. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing, and I will see you in my next video. Bye, guys.